we've all become accustomed to the Zoom call. So, Kareem, let's do it. All right, you're good. Uh, so, episode three, uh, unspoken conversations with rising coaches, uh, the search firm that is the tree for the treeless. Um, we have today, uh, first, Dawn Stewart. Uh, she is the Director of Athletics and the Interim VP for Student Affairs at Otterbein, which is Division Three in Columbus, Ohio. Um, she's also been the Athletic Director at Capital. Um, she's been an Assistant Director of Athletic and Business Communication, as well as the Director of Ticketing Services at the University of Dayton. Um, and then prior to that, she was at Otterbein University as the Women's Tennis Coach and a Recruiting Coordinator. Um, she got her Master's in Sports Management her bachelor's in business administration, and then she's working on her doctorate now at, at uh, Ohio State. I can't really say the Ohio State for some family <laughs> issues, but um, so that'll be our first speaker. Along with her is uh, Tyler Jones. Tyler Jones is the deputy director of athletics and the external operations, of external operations, I'm sorry, at Cleveland State. Um, he has been the Ohio assistant athletic director of fan experience. Um, he's been the Eastern Michigan Director of Athletics and Marketing and Promotion. He's been at the University of Tennessee for as a sales assistant. Uh, Tyler also played Division I football at Eastern Michigan. Uh, he tied Jerry Rice's record for receptions in a game his senior year with 23. Um, and if I could say anything about that, me and Tyler were college roommates. In my senior year, he was my quarterback. So, see, the switch was – positive for him. Um, and he also was my teammate on the basketball court. He also played Division I uh, basketball at Eastern Michigan also. Um, Tyler's earned his master's in sports ma management and his bachelor's in business market and marketing and business. Um, and as we talked about, as we as we develop this show and develop this platform, our, our goal is to be epic, right? Educating professionals and integrating cultures with where our country is and where our world is today with uh, as episode one, I talked about with systemic racism, uh, with the, the social differences going on right now, with the world trying to find a way to unite. I think it's important that we use sports as the, uh, the front porch to making a positive change. Uh, we, we work with student athletes. We work in a profession where it, it positively influences the entire world. It collaborates families, um, it unites people, gives people something to cheer about and something to feel good about. So why not educate each other on how to produce the best leaders and the best, best platform for change? Um, so just to build off last week's episode with our final four guys, our two guests who uh, had won a national championship and been to the, the, the final four, we'll move forward with some small college and assistant, assistant athletic directors that have been in that field. Uh, Dawn, you'll go first. Dawn and Tyler have done a great job of just talking and figuring out what the, how they wanted the show to go tonight. So I'm really going to leave it to them and put it in their hands to be more hands-on with the audience and, and more uh, impactful for us to take from, from uh, tonight's meeting. So Dawn, we'll just introduce Dawn first. We usually go uh, ladies first and then Tyler will follow up. Well, Travis, thank you for that. And thanks for the opportunity to connect with all of you tonight. I'm especially excited to uh, be pre, you know co-presenting with with Tyler. Um, you know we spent some time talking earlier this week, and um, you know I, I, we're really once again excited to come to you all tonight. And and uh, he mentioned on the front end of this, but I'm not sure if everybody was online yet. We want this to be organic. I mean, so I'm going to start just by telling you my story and and my career path and how I got you know from point A to point B to point C and. Feel free to interrupt me. Feel free to ask questions. And, and as our conversation evolves tonight, too, please feel free to do that. Once again, we want this to be um, a, a conversation that serves all of you, um, not one that's the Don and Tyler show, even though that we've joked that that's really what this is about. But <laughs> uh, we want this to be about you. And once again, Travis, thanks for the opportunity. But uh, as Travis mentioned, my name is Don Stewart. Um, I'm Vice President for Student Affairs, Director of Athletics at Otterbein University. Otterbein is my alma mater. So that's really where my career started. Everything started for me. I'm a former student athlete. I'm a tennis, former tennis player um, and obviously was a student athlete at Otterbein. And uh, I was a business major. I um, really thought, especially, and I came from small town Ohio. I came from New Philadelphia, Ohio. I don't know if anyone knows where New Philadelphia is, but it's about 30 miles south of Canton, Ohio, um, Football Hall of Fame territory. So long story short, when I came to Otterbein, which is in the northeast corner of Columbus, 
I really, first of all, I, I like the small school environment. It gave me an opportunity to be competitive as well. Um, but it was Columbus and that's really coming from a small town. What I was looking for was, was that location. I knew I was probably going to major in business and I, I, in my mind, thought I was going to go work in corporate America in the big city of Columbus, you know, and uh, that was going to be my career track. And um, little did I know that, and I'm, I'm so fortunate that athletics was going to just remain a part of my life, you know, from there on out. And um, so I, I was navigating my way through my, my college career, once again, both as a student athlete and, you know, as an undergrad. And um, I was pursuing internships, um, you know, in, in my degree, and, and those were going really well, and that was, those were great experiences. Um, meanwhile, I had a, a campus job, a work-study job, that allowed me to work in the athletic department. And that was really my introduction to working in, in college athletics. And it's, it's funny, because we're going to spend some time talking about networking tonight. My networking really started, I guess, when I was in high school, because it was my high school AD who set me up with the Otterbein, with my work, my campus job at Otterbein, because he had previously worked at Otterbein. He made a phone call, got me a job. You know, that's just kind of how it all worked. And it was just, as I reflect back on that, I think, gosh, at 18 years old, I was, had some network in place that I didn't even realize. But um, long story short, my, my work study job was in the athletic department. I was working in a, a role where, um, I worked for a full-time professional who supported all of our coaches recruiting efforts every single day. So if you're not as familiar with Division III recruiting, and especially at that time, this is back in the early to mid-90s, um, the recruiting efforts really started in, in kind of mass quantity, where coaches would start out with large databases or large pools of names and, you know, essentially start to interact or try to solicit um, those prospective students, and then they would whittle, um, whittle down their, you know, their recruiting list from, from those interactions. So I was a student who was assigned to the football program to help support all of their recruiting efforts in that fashion. And I loved it. I loved it. It was behind the scenes work. I loved, you know, working with the coaches and kind of learning who and why and how they were doing what they were doing. It was just fascinating to me, and it was a different look at sport than what I had ever had before. Um, you know, I was a three sport athlete in high school, once again, concentrated on tennis in college, but I just didn't, didn't have that perspective. So I really, you know, came to love that. And long story short, when my uh, time came to graduate uh, at Otterbein, the person, the, the, the full-time professional that I was working for at Otterbein um, was moving on to another job. So her position was open. Um, so I interviewed and, and I was really fortunate. I had the opportunity to, to take that job right out, of, right out of college. So I stepped right into college athletics right away in a full-time position, which doesn't happen often, um, really doesn't happen in the college uh, athletics landscape, whether you're pursuing coaching or administration or whatever, that just doesn't happen all the time. So I was very, very blessed and I had good people around me that, that you know, put me in that and trusted me in that position. I spent about two years, so that was my recruiting coordinator role, and I spent about two years in that role where I served all of Otterbein sport programs, um, helping them to recruit and, you know, manage to their recruiting process uh, and really in any way possible. And once again, just continued to fall in love with college athletics and thought, gosh, I, I really want to pursue this as a career. No more corporate America, you know, ideal in my mind. This is really something I wanted to do. And so I started at just having a lot of conversations with people on campus in terms of our coaching staff and people who were once again, seasoned coaches and professionals and essentially having the, how did you get to where you are conversation um, as well as trying to have those conversations outside of Otterbein too, with really anyone who would sit down and talk with me and um, you know, came to find out that, you know, maybe I needed to pursue, you know, an additional degree that that would be, wouldn't be a bad idea. Um, you know, and then also I was at that point in time, I was, I was entering year six at Otterbein, four years as an undergrad, two years as a young professional. And, you know, it might be time for me to leave. It might be time for me to experience, um, something else. And so, um, so I started to do that. I started to put out, you know, applications and really try to search for other opportunities. And, um, I ended up getting called for an interview at, at the University of Dayton. And so um, my, my story at Dayton, I'll, I'll really credit Dayton for being the place where I professionally grew up in a lot of ways and learned, learned a lot of hard lessons as a young professional that I am so grateful for um, now. Um, and really, 
when I went to Dayton to interview, I was going over to interview for a, an entry level marketing position within their uh, athletics program and um, had a great day. I interviewed with Steve Watson that day. Travis and Tyler know Steve and, and that's how I got to know Steve and, um, and just had a great experience that day. Late in the day, I was sitting down with their senior woman administrator and she had stepped out of her office for some reason. And um, the athletic director at the time, Ted Kissel, happened to step into the office. And I, I wasn't scheduled to meet with Ted. He wasn't there to talk with me. He just happened to walk in. I think he wanted to talk with Megan for a minute and maybe grab a piece of candy. And that was it. You know, they were going to have a, just a quick interaction. But that was probably a day that really changed the trajectory of my, my career because Ted came in and he's just very engaging and very warm and you know so he sits down and we just strike up a conversation and he asks me kind of the classic you know well wh what are you doing here where, where do you see yourself in five to ten years you know what's what do you want to do and you know in this athletics world and you know being the wise 22 year old that I was I said well I'm going to be an AD and uh, and he said he looks at me with a little smirk on his face which I think is the same smile I give young professionals also now when they sit tell me they want to be an AD and I he said, well, tell me, tell me why that is. And I, you know, ended up telling him about how I thought my division three experience really prepared me to manage any program, any size. And, you know, because what you learn at, at that level is resourcefulness and, and, and perseverance, you know, through a lot of different types of challenges. And, you know, we ended up having this really great conversation. And, you know, once again, at 22, you know, just kind of feeling no pain at that point in time, I'm, uh, who knows what else I said. But one thing led to the next, Ted and I end up into our conversation evolves a little bit more casually. We start talking about tennis. He's a tennis player. I'm a tennis player. And the next thing you know, we're just, we're just talking and we're having a great conversation and a great interaction. Finished my interview at Dayton and I got a phone call from Ted the next day. And he said, um, Don, he said, um, I wanted to reach out to you because we, we don't, we think you're overqualified for the marketing position that you interviewed for, which Later on, I realized it's kind of AD speak a little bit like for, you know, we don't think you're right for that position, but we've got something else for you. So anyway, so long story short, um, Ted ends up saying, he said, listen, you know, we've got something else in mind. And he said, we, uh, on occasion, I'll bring in or I'll create a position that's kind of an assistant to our ADs, where it's for a young professional that's you know, young and hungry and wants to learn the business. And you, what you're going to do is you're going to shadow each of our, our assistant ADs and any projects or anything that they have going on, you know, you're going to be a part of them. And I'm like, this is awesome. Like I have just arrived. This is the best scenario ever for me. So we agree to it. Life's good. About six weeks goes by. My buddy, Steve Watson gives me a call. Steve was the, uh, an assistant AD for kind of external relations at the time. He oversaw ticketing and marketing, a lot of different things at Dayton and he's now uh, now oil. And so uh, Steve says, hey Don, um, I see you've got some ticket office experience on your resume. Um, we'd like for you to come over and manage our box office. And I, so side note, okay, division three ticketing, division three athletics, the largest crowd we probably entertain is probably 2,000 to 2,500 people. We sell general admission roll tickets. It's very basic, it's cash business. I mean, that's what it is. University of Dayton basketball, if you followed, you know, NCAA basketball this year, they had a great run and were, you know, set to go even further. And uh, basketball is a way of life at UD. And their ticket sales and their men's basketball program, along with a handful of other sport programs, are how they fund the rest of their athletic program. So it is a huge economic driver for them. Um, and it's a really big deal. So once again, here I am at age 22, 23, being asked to manage the box office, which would manage all of the revenue that's attached to those programs. And I said, sure, no problem, I got this. So um, long story short, um, I accepted that role, went over to Dayton, and um, that was definitely a moment in my career where it was very much about, or I would say I was very driven by the fact or the idea that I was not going to fail and what I was going to do. I, I just, I didn't know what I was doing. I was learning on the fly. Um, you know, I was trying to engage anyone and everyone who would talk with me about man managing ticket sales and driving revenue and kind of any of that. And so trying to surround myself with the right people and ask all the right questions. But 
underneath it all, it was just that ideal. And I would imagine that all of you can relate to that. I'm not going to fail. I'm not going to fail when, I, when I'm doing this. So I'll fast forward a bit. So I, I spent about two years in the box office at Dayton, and it was a great experience. It's taught me so much, so much that I still rely on this day in terms of especially the customer service component. In everything that we do in college athletics, it's all about customer service. It's all about relating to other people. It's all about serving our student athletes and our coaches and, and their families. And there's so much about that process that imp impacts how I interact with uh, folks to this day. And so I spent two years in the box office. Um, the administration knew that I didn't want to um, stay on the external side of the business. They knew that I wanted to be closer to coaches and student athletes and further define, you know, refine my skills in some ways on the sport program side of things. So they gave me an opportunity to come over to the internal side of the business where I became the business manager. A few years later, I must have done something right because they gave me more responsibilities and they handed me sports information. Then they, a few years later, they handed me more responsibilities and gave me um, the SWA title and academic programming for our student athletes and managing some sport programs and some other things. And so long story short, you know, I spent eight year, about eight years at Dayton in total, surrounded by great people who ultimately trusted me to do these different things and, and grow in my career, pushed and challenged me along the way, which wasn't a comfortable ride, um, but ultimately gave me a great foundation. I had a chance then to, um, I applied for the Capital University AD job. Um, and so Capital University, another small division three school in Columbus, they're actually our arch rival at Otterbein. So um, anyways, I applied for the Capital job and um, I was, I, I looked at that position as just an opportunity for me to throw my hat in the ring. If I got an interview, it would be a great learning experience. There was no way I thought I was ever going to make my way through that process or, or land that job or get the, get the offer. Um, and I guess, fortunately for me, that's, that's what happened. Um, I navigated the process. And, and I'll, I'll tell you, in large part, and kind of, this kind of relates back to something that Travis said at the front end. I was 29 years old when I applied um, for the capital job and, and ultimately got the job, a 29-year-old female. And, and a large part of what was going through my mind at that point in time was, there's no way they're going to hire a 29-year-old female to be the next AD at, at Capital University. And it was the first time I ever had that kind of thought. I never thought about my identity as a female in college athletics, maybe in a leadership role. I just, you know, I set all ego aside when I say that I was 29. I don't, I don't say that to, you know, for any self-promoting reason. I say that because that's really the first time where once again, my identity kind of came to my mind. And that might sound silly, but it's, but it's true. I just never really thought about that. And I didn't know that a few months later, after I accepted the position, I was going to start being asked questions about what's it like to be a female leader in, in college athletics? And, you know, how do you handle that? What's, you know, are there different pressures that come along? I mean, I didn't know I was going to get those questions. I just wanted to build a competitive sport program. That's all that mattered to me. I wanted to surround myself with the best coaches, the best student athletes, and build the most robust Division three program possible. That didn't enter my mind. But suddenly I had to think about that. And I started to have questions and I'll be honest, I kind of wrestled with that a little bit and we can come back to that later. But I got the Capital job. I was spent four years at Capital, great years. And then I got a call from Otterbein and I had the opportunity to come back home. And I've been at Otterbein now for about nine years. And uh, just last year had the opportunity uh, after my longtime vice president um, retired to step into his role as, as interim vice president for student affairs and AD. Um, and then ultimately um, just permanently moved into that role. So, so I'm wearing two hats right now, um, but uh, it's, been an, it's been an incredible journey, an incredible ride, and a, just a lot of lessons learned along the way. Um, but I'll, I'll honestly say it's all credit to great people around me and um, a network that has supported me through so many different highs and lows and, um, you know, just, just once again, great people around me. So I think with that, I'll, I'll go ahead. I've talked enough. So I'll hand it over to Tyler. <laughs> no. And tell his that, journey, his story. That, first off, um, Don, everyone, man, her story is phenomenal. Her path is unprecedented. We are very fortunate to have her uh, be a part of this conversation. I, again, we, we spoke on Sunday, and we had such a great conversation, and I was so inspired by her story, what she's been through, what she's accomplished. So 
we're fortunate to have her on the call. But before I kind of get go Thanks, through man. my um, experience, I wanted to say I just commend all of you for investing in your um, your careers, right? Uh, taking ownership of your professional development. Now that that's something to to be commended, especially during this time of COVID. Um, and, and, and budgets are shrinking and you're, you're, you're allocating time and your efforts in other areas that typically the first thing that you sacrifice is your own self-development when you're trying to prioritize where you spend your time. So I want to just commend all of you for taking the time to invest in yourself, to look inward and to reach out for some professional development. That, that's co commendable. But a little bit about me. I'm Tyler, as Travis mentioned. I'm Tyler Jones. I'm from Detroit, Michigan. Um, I attended Eastern Michigan for undergrad, two sports student athlete all through high school. And my family dynamic, I credit all of my success to, to my family. Uh, my mother and father, uh, we were a very regimented upbringing. I mean, first it was, you know, your faith, then family then school, and then sport. And that's kind of well, the rubric of how I kind of moved as a youngster and how my family really created that framework for me at a young age of, you know, it's really our faith that we're going to invest our time and energy in our faith and make sure we pull our family tight. And then academic piece was the conduit to everything. So that really drove me through my childhood. And my goal, honestly, was to go to school for free. That was my number one goal. That drove me as a kid is like whatever I need to do in the classroom, you know, in sport for me to go to college for free. Cause I knew my family couldn't afford it. So that, that was my driving force was trying to get to school, trying to play the sport that I love, try to further my education and try to minimize the impact on my, on my mother and father, knowing that I had, we had, I had two siblings. Right. So that really drove me in. I was fortunate to earn a scholarship at Eastern Michigan for football. Um, and I had an unbelievable student athlete experience. I was able to experience so many things. And the two things that, that stood out to me, and we'll kind of get into this later, is two things that really stuck with me is, is access and opportunity. And that, that I didn't know what that meant when I started this journey, but it's truly the access and the opportunity piece. And, and I'll, I'm gonna weave that in into my story. And for me, it was the access to, to higher education, right? That, that was a, a pillar of my success, was the access to higher education. My family knew how important education was. So they took me out of the public school and tried to put me in a private school, right? Because they knew how, how premium education was. And then the other part is opportunity. And, and the opportunity was through athletics. Right, so the, the athletics piece afforded me all of these opportunities to travel, meet people, connect with folks, but I couldn't experience that without the academic piece. So I kind of fast forward to my, my time as a student athlete, and, and this speaks to pouring into other people, right? As coaches, as administrators, our goal is to pour into young people's lives. And I'm fortunate that I had two very, very important people that poured into my life at a time that was really critical for me, right? So the student athlete, you got really two tracks, typically for a person of color, usually, is that do I specialize in this athletic field and, and maybe play professional basketball or football, or do I maybe get into coaching and teaching, right? And that was kind of what I wrestled with until these two people poured into my life and gave me the opportunity to learn a bit, little bit about intercollegiate athletics administration. So I remember my junior year, our SWA, our name was Stephanie Vandenberg, and she asked me that question, what are you gonna do after graduation? And most kids at that age are like, I'm just trying to graduate, not go to study table, the, the small micro things, right? I'm not focused on past, you know, graduating. She said, hey, listen, I want you to intern with me in the department just to learn a little bit about what we do. And from that moment on, I was just fascinated by what's happening behind the scenes. So as coaches, as student athletes, you show up to the facility, the lights are on, referees are there, cones are out, laundry is washed if you have somebody doing laundry. All of these things are happening behind the scenes that as a student athlete or as a coach, you're just not aware 
who was managing it. And when I had that opportunity and that access to see what was happening behind the scenes, I was like, this is what I want to do. I want to be able to help move things forward. I want to be able to support our student athletes. I want to be able to provide guidance. I want to be able to pour into young people's lives the way our athletic director at the time, Dr. Gregg, that was a person of color, right? I saw somebody that looked like me in this role that was impacting my life. So after that, I, I was afforded an opportunity to, to, to serve as a graduate assistant after my senior year. Again, a, a more access, more opportunity to learn about the business. <clears throat> and then I was at Eastern Michigan for seven years. So very similar to Don, I'm like, I need to go somewhere else. I need to experience something else. So I went to the University of Tennessee and worked in their athletic department. You talk about a culture shop, right? So for being from Detroit, right, a, a pretty prominent, you know, community that folks look like me. Then you go to Eastern Michigan where our athletic director was a person of color. Our women's basketball coach was a person of color. Our football coach was a person of color. And our AD was a person of color. So I was just accustomed to diversity and people looking like me in these roles. You extract me from that environment and toss me in Knoxville, Tennessee, where you're literally the only person of color in the department. And you're talking about being put into an incubator for growth in about a year. I was there for a year. It felt like it was five years. And it was probably the best decision of my life to go from a place of comfort to a place of uncertainty and really rebrand and, and rebuild myself. So I was there for about a year. Great experience. Came back to Eastern Michigan. They offered me a job full time to, to lead all their marketing external efforts. And then I had a call to go to Ohio State. So I, I came to Ohio State in an entry level position. And that's where I learned being uh, excellent in your role, right? I think sometimes we get so focused on how do I grow? How do I move up? And in that environment, I learned if you put your head down and be excellent at your, at your job, that people will take notice. So for, from there, I started as an entry-level employee and worked my way up to one of a, a senior administrative role. <clears throat> and, and that's where I learned to really grow and network. And we'll get into that a little bit more. So that Ohio State for seven years, and that's where I figured out I, I want to I wanna get back to that Eastern Michigan experience, a more intimate department, a smaller department. At Ohio State, we had about 1,000 student athletes, 30 plus sports. 400 employees, and I, I really ex enjoyed my experience working at Eastern Michigan. So Cleveland State um, had, a, had a job opening, a deputy AD. AD reached out to me. Uh, we had a little recruiting type of period. I went up for a couple of visits to Cleveland State, met some staff, and fell in love with the campus. And I really, really enjoyed my experience here at Cleveland State in my role, a smaller department, a little bit more autonomy, more room to grow. But that's my story. And again, I want to want to hit on the access and the opportunity. And we're going to weave that into some of our, our topics moving forward. Um, phenomenal stories. Uh, and those of you who have heard the, the prior two episodes, I told you this will be epic. Um, you, you truly have two high level professionals that have operated at that level as a minority. Um, and I think that's what makes this special. Uh, as we get into the question and the answer, and, and feel free to step in and, and put questions in the chat, and I'll kind of narrate through that. But I want to get us started. Um, and really, I want to start with you, Tyler, just because you touched on a point on, on episode one. We talked about the systemic racism piece and the importance of, as a student athlete, picking the right de degree in order to change the dynamics of your life. Because a lot of times in the minority situation, we're told, like, just get, just get a degree. Like if you just get a degree, you're going to find a way to be successful, right? Um, so you talked about access and opportunity and who helped you. And you talked about Stephanie, who I know, and she was not a coach. And for us on this platform, the majority of the guys, if not the mass majority, are coaches. And we are educating and growing because we are the hands-on first level of contact with our student athletes. And in order right. to lead them in the right direction, we got to know what tactics and what experiences and what things caught, made that light bulb moment happen in order for you to, hey, choose the right degree, take that internship, find a way to understand that, all right, maybe chasing the dream isn't 
isn't the right thing to do now because for you in your situation, I mean, you got a, a record that's the same and tied with one of the greatest receivers of all times. And you chose not to pursue professional sports and it's paid off for you tenfold. Right. Um, so just what things along the way or what things and conversations did you have with Stephanie at that time that decided to make you say, hey, this internship is best for me? I think it was trusting your mentors, right? Trusting the people that invested in your life was really, really important. So I trusted Stephanie because she was present in my life as a non-coach, right? So as administrators and your mentors, I think it's really important to diversify your circle of influence, diversify your, your network. It's really good to network with other coaches, right? Assistant coaches or head coaches, right? That's really, really important. But what I, what I appreciate with Travis and I's relationship, I'm not a coach. So when Travis and I have conversations, I'm not giving him a perspective of what a coach would do. I'm giving him perspective of what an athletics director would do and what, what Don and I maybe would value. So it's important, <clears throat> excuse me, to um, diversify your, your network. But in terms of a degree track, I, would, I did ask questions. So like my ultimate goal, when I went through that internship, I saw another side of the business. So my question was like, well, what are some of the degrees that you need to be successful in this particular environment? So the feedback was you need a postgraduate degree in some type of sport management or MBA track, right? Because our business is heavy management and also a huge part of it is business. So when I heard that feedback, that helped me be intentional. Okay, maybe I need to further think about what's a post secondary degree either in business or in sport management and that led me to the graduate assistantship track so for me how how it was presented was like hey you're able to further your academic career right and earn some some really important experience but also you're going to be a graduate assistant and as a graduate assistant i'm sure many of you maybe experience it you're doing everything you're doing ticketing you're doing facilities you're doing recruiting depending upon not going out, right? But you're helping out from a recruiting perspective. You're doing events. I mean, you're doing everything. So for me, I was able to further my academic career, but also gain invaluable experience as a graduate assistant. So for me, I just asked the question, this is my ultimate goal, right? I think at that point, as a 23-year-old, I'm like, I think I want to be an AD. I think I want to work in an athletic administration. Dr. Gregg, as an AD, talk about your experience. Stephanie, share, share your story. And what I've learned, people are willing to share their story if you ask. People love to talk about themselves, not on purpose, but you're prideful about your story. Like you want to share that. Like you want to share your experiences with people. All you got to do is ask. If you go to your athletic director or someone and say, hey, listen, I'm trying to grow. I'm trying to grow my experience. I want to learn about this business. Do you have 30 minutes to talk about your story? I'm telling you, it's going to be an hour conversation. You say 30, they're going to give you an hour. So for me, I was comfortable with just asking, hey, I see you're at this particular position. Would you mind walking me through how you got there? Share some of your mistakes. Share some of your, your successes. And that's what I did. And that, that helped me craft my path to, to where I am today. I think if I could piggyback on that just for a minute, I, I think Tyler makes an excellent point about the importance of diversifying your network and, and, and being intentional about that. It's easy for us to get in our comfort zones and have our people that we like to talk to and that we trust. And th that's great. That's good that we have that circle. But I, I think in terms of wanting to grow and, and, and develop, you know, whether it's as a coach or an administrator or whatever it is that you're pursuing, you know, looking beyond your immediate circle or even asking your immediate circle, who would they connect you with? Who, who pushes them? Who, you know, who do they go to when, when they need a shoulder or, or an outside perspective or, or something along those lines? And, and I think that's so valuable. And, and, and you'll find those people, Tyler's right on. I mean, in the sense that people are willing to, to share and to talk, to talk about what they've learned. And I think, I mean, I'm going to imagine that you're all pretty smart people because you're on this, you're on this tonight and you're, you're wanting to grow and develop. 
you figure out who's feeding you lines and, and who's not being authentic with you, okay, pretty quickly. I think that's easy to figure out. You'll find the people that are authentic, and those are the people that you keep coming back to and, and that you ask good questions and that you want to stay connected with. Um, those are the people that are going to be willing to, to continue to feed you, especially when, when you need it. But diversifying that network and being intentional, and whether it's your SWA, your AD, um, Tyler and I talked earlier this week, we talked about our faculty reps, you know, people that are going to essentially be on search committees, um, you know, maybe on your campus, talk with those folks about who they would connect you with on other campuses. Talk to your, you know, your university president or your vice presidents, who, whoever you can get to, all in the spirit of bettering yourself and, and, and that opportunity to grow and develop. Those are, those are great conversations and really valuable. And once again, don't be afraid to ask them, who else would they connect you with and encourage you to reach out to so that you can grow and develop and learn more? I, yeah, and I will second that. I think it, it's, it's very comfortable to network amongst your peers. That's easy. I mean, that's, you should yeah. be doing that organically, right? The part that's difficult is getting outside of your comfort zone. Like you, everyone on this call, should know who your president is at your institution. And if you don't, you, should, you need to cultivate that relationship, A. B, you need, to be, you need to have the cell phone number of your athletics director. So if you're, if you're a third assistant or a graduate assistant or what have you, you should have the, the, the phone number, cell phone number of your AD, 100%, right? And, or if that, your SWA. You, you should have those relationships as an assistant coach, right? And cultivate those relationships is really, really important because typically, to Don's point, that's your search committee. That's, that's, those are the folks that Don or myself is going to bring into the room as we're evaluating head coaches for our program. We want to know what campus thinks. We want to make sure that the president's office has some exposure. We want to make sure our faculty athletics rep if you don't know who that individual is, you need to immediately because they have influence on campus. You got to be able to cultivate those relationships and be intentional about that. And that can be uncomfortable, but I think it's extremely important. Let me jump in for you for a second, Tyler, because I want it to really be twofold. And we got some questions inside of the chat that I'm, that I'm going to get to also. But with Dawn, you said at 29, you reached that, that point where it was like, hey, I'm a female at 29. I want to lead a, a male-dominated industry. Tyler, you are an inner city kid who works among a white male dominated industry. For us, we have over the last two or three months really learned and got a lot of these same points and tips, but how do we create an infrastructure to put in place for our student athletes to change systemic issues of the same people continue to have the same conversation? So Tyler, I say for you is unique because you were intentional about going in and talking to someone in that department. Whereas there are so many, right? The numbers are so lopsided on those student athletes that don't make that intention. So us as coaches, it's our responsibility to, if we're doing right by our student athletes, to direct them, for them to build a relationship with the president, for them to build a relationship with the SWAs, for them to, to build a relationship with the athletic directors. And um, when they're able to do that before they graduate, then they have a game plan for after they graduate. They don't end up being 25, 26, and 27 trying to figure these things out. And a lot of the guys on here are, are coaches that have influence among players that don't take advantage of the opportunity that they have when they're a particular player. So what things or suggestions or insights or stories that you have, you say, I would have did this different, or these are some things I would do if I wanted to influence my, my student athletes in order to be proactive on campus and build these relationships and choose the right degrees because for us to change our dynamics of our profession, as well as the dynamics of our world right now, is going to take the student athletes and, uh, to take the bull by the horn, right? So we got to teach them in order for them to grow. I'll I, I answer that. And then I, from, from my end is that for our young people to, to do it, they got to see it. And that, that was my experience. If I didn't get a, a, the access or opportunity to see on this side of the shop, I would have never knew that existed. So how are we exposing our young people that that's an actual pass, right? Hey, I want to be a head coach. No, screw that. I want to be a GM. I want to be an owner of a team, right? So, so for us as leaders of young people, 
and coaches, are you inviting your president to come speak with the team? I'm sure if you said, hey, president of this institution, I would love for you to come to a team meeting and talk about your story. A president of a university would say, absolutely. They are students first, right? They are, they are, they are a part of our student body. The president is required to engage with the students, right? But are our coaches reaching out to our presidents to come and interact with our teams, right? So a president comes in, shares her story, his story with the, with the program. Now our student athletes are saying, okay, what, what's the president? What do they do? Well, how do you become a president? And now they're curious. So I think the first part of it, Travis, if you're talking about tactics, is exposing our young people to these individuals that literally are right next door to them, that they have no clue what they're doing is, is one. And then the second part of it, and I had this conversation with our coaches through this social unrest, and I'll kind of share something that's personal, is that some of our coaches that are not of color are struggling trying to get our student athletes of color to express how they're feeling about what's happening. And I, I, I challenged the coach and said, wait, you're expecting a student athlete, 18 or 22, to have courage to talk in front of their teammates about trauma that they've experienced, right? But you're not modeling that, that behavior with their, with their team. Are you showing vulnerability and talking about the difficult topics in front of your team? Are you sharing stories of your childhood and sharing trauma? Are you talking about these topics organically within your team? So if you're not modeling that behavior of curiosity and interest, why are we expecting our young people to do, to do the same? So those are two tactics. Demonstrate the behaviors you want your, 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 your student athletes to demonstrate is one. And also be intentional and expose your young people to the things that you want them to see that they're maybe not exposed to on the day to day. So that, that's my response to, to that question, Travis. Tyler, that was awesome. It's you're you're a coach of coaches. I can't, that's why you're a great administrator. So thanks for breaking that down that way. I, I would wholeheartedly agree with you. I, you know, I, I think on, on my end and what um, I see others doing, and and you all can do this as well, is spend time with your athletes, having the conversation, asking them about what they want to do, where do they see themselves. You know your student athletes. You know, you know, how to steer and guide them, but, you know, also, especially taking the time just one-on-one -on -one to have those conversations. Um, you know, it, I mean, Tyler's talked already about there were people in his life that did that, that took the time to do that. There were people in my life that took the time to do that. And, you know, and as a result, I think I can speak for both of us. We're trying to pay that forward with, with our student athletes and with our coaches. And, um, and those are the conversations that, that I enjoy having. I, I do um, uh, all of our NCAA um, rules compliance for all of our 500 plus student athletes. And I enjoy, so that means I have a, a team meeting at, at the beginning of, of our academic year with each team. And not only do we talk about NCAA rules, for me, it's my time to connect with my student athletes. And for them to get to know me outside of their coaches, just even if it's for, you know, 20 minutes or a half to a half an hour, it's my time to look at them and say, my door is open to you. Let's have a conversation. I want to know what you want to do with your life. I want to be able to help, you know, and I'm, and I'm in a position where I can do that. You should take advantage of me as, as someone within your network. So, um, and, and some of my student athletes take advantage of that, you know, and, and some don't. And, um, you know, and, and I don't think that that's all on them too. It's still on me to try to connect and, and try to find ways to, uh, to reach them too. But I think, um, I think we got to start by asking the questions and, and, and being willing to have the one-on-one -on -one conversations with them and, and getting them to think beyond what's immediately maybe in front of them in terms of their immediate experience. Cause the other point I'll say to that, and then I'll, then I'll shut up, um, is that, and we'll talk about, I'm hoping we'll talk about this in a little bit is that, Student athletes sometimes, if if there's a if there's an experience that you think they should engage in, um, that might be a little different or or maybe not um, maybe doesn't directly relate to what they're currently doing, they may not see value in it. We're probably all that way, right? Um, it's it's 
it's basically the idea of getting pushed out of your comfort zone and maybe be encouraged to experience or look at something or, or participate in something that's a little bit different. And let's face it, there's so much value in that. There's just so much growth opportunity in that. And so, um, you know, that's, that's where I would, uh, you know, once again, having that one-on-one -on -one conversation with them, engaging with them, asking what they want to do, what they want to be a part of, where do they see themselves and encouraging them to try things that may not be directly related, but still is going to help develop them. That's an important part of this process and the journey. No, I, Don, that was great. And what I pull from that is that I think as former, all former student athletes or players uh, that have competed, we're all averse to failure. So we're, we're, we're built to not want to fail. So it, it typically try, we try to avoid it. What, but, but through failure, we can grow. So how do we normalize failure? How do we get to a point where it's yeah. okay to fail? Because from failure, we've all made mistakes. That's awesome lessons for us. So to that point, how do we get our young people to Travis's point? It's okay to take some calculated risks, right? push ourselves out of our comfort zone, be curious, have a curious mindset, have a growth mindset. And those are things that as leaders of young people, we got to demonstrate that. We got to show them what that looks like. We just can't expect them to do it without modeling that behavior for those people. And as coaches, it's hard for us to be vulnerable. As leaders, it's hard for us to be vulnerable because when we think about leadership, we think about you don't make mistakes, you're strong, you're certain, you got tremendous conviction. These are all these attributes that we associate with leadership. But leaders, leaders F up. They make, they make mistakes. They don't have all the answers. They're vulnerable at times. And those are all things that we have to normalize in our, in our business. Because the more that we normalize it, our student athletes see it, it's safe for them to be vulnerable. It's safe for them to make mistakes because our leadership, our coaches are doing the same. Within reason, we don't want you guys to make mistakes and break rules. Now, I'm not saying that. We know we know the proper rules, but it's okay to make a decision here and there that that could be again a calculated risk. Yes. Man, look, you had a question in chat. Uh, feel free, go ahead. Thank you both for doing this, uh, uh, Tyler. We spoke a little bit before the recording started, but I'll just introduce myself briefly. My name is Menelik Fernandez. I'm from Toronto, Ontario in Canada. Uh, I coach at Fleming College, which is about an hour and a half east of Toronto in Peterborough, Ontario. And I am currently in the interim head coach position, sort of stuck in flux because of COVID. Don't really know what's going on there. So uh, I think some of what both Tyler and Don have commented on has sort of addressed the question that I put in there. But there are also several other things that both of you said. And since this is unspoken issues, I'm going to speak a little bit right now about some of the things that you mentioned that like, ultimately, I'm looking for guidance, I suppose, because you're both in athletic director positions and you're uh, in similar sort of areas, I guess. Uh, but what I'm coming from, basically, so my question originally was, what does the path to better representation for people of color and women look like to both of you? So obviously, uh, like I'm an interracial person myself, and I've, I've made the joke sometimes that like, I honestly feel like some of the people who hired me sometimes didn't even know that. Like, they're like, oh, I didn't know that at all type deal kind of thing. So I like, I guess because I'm so light skinned, I'm passing in certain elements, but it's like when I speak on certain issues, I get the drawback look like, why do you care? Or uh, we don't want to talk about this. And there's a general temperament in Canada that systemic bias does not exist the way that it does in the United States. But I mean, obviously past month, a lot of people are really speaking up quite a bit more towards that. But like just some of the things that you said, like, you know, I, I messaged Travis privacy, privately and he told me to speak on it. But like you guys were like, uh, Tyler mentioned you should have your athletic director's uh, cell phone number as an assistant coach. I believe if you were an assistant coach in any of the programs that I have been in as a coach previously, you would get fired for asking for that. Like that is, that is the level of detachment that we have here. And uh, then who was the other one that I had said to, to Travis? Oh, the reaching out to the president of your university or college to come and speak to 
the people that you coach uh, to give them a path to be able to get to where they are, to hear their story, so to speak, there's no chance mine would come. None. And that's at any of the schools that I've been at previously. So the first part of my question was the, what does the path to better representation look like for both of you? I'd definitely like to hear your answer. Uh, and then the second part was, given the scenario that I've painted, presented, so to speak, what sort of steps would you take to recommend to me what to do to speak on those kinds of issues? Because I believe that, like, like just full transparency, there's 108 men's basketball coaching jobs in Canada across the entire country. And about six years ago, I pivoted from a pretty good income to because like, I want to coach basketball. It's when I, like, I guess I had a midlife crisis or a midlife awareness and decided this is what I want to do. So when I pivoted, I've worked my butt off and volunteered a lot and sacrificed a lot of income. And now that I'm sort of in a position, it's like, do I speak on this and become a whistleblower, quote unquote, and risk potentially getting fired? Or do I just go with the grain, so to speak? Dawn, let's go with you to start out. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing. Um, thank you for, for being so honest and open. I think one of the first things that comes to my mind is the importance of the right fit of the institution. Um, and, and sometimes that's easier said than done. So I, I'm not putting something out there that I know is just you can snap your fingers or wave a wand and, and get somewhere and it's you know suddenly a, a great place for you. But I think um, as, as you're pursuing coaching jobs and looking for the right opportunities, connecting with the right administration who values the same thing that you do, um, you know, and, and believes in transparency and promotion of, of their people, um, you know, and, and, um, and investment in their staff um, so that you can have the phone number of the AD and, um, and just that there's, there's that uh, ability for that kind of dialogue, I think is really critical. So I, I think one of the things that I would encourage you to think about is, and maybe you already know this, is, is this, is this your forever home, so to speak, with the institution that you're at? And, you know, sometimes, like I said, there are other things that factor into that too, certainly family life and location and, you know, all of those types of things. So I'm, I'm certainly not trying to make assumptions or judgments or anything like that but because I know there are other factors that come in, but perhaps thinking about, is this the long-term place? Because what I can tell you is, is that there are places that um, are gonna value what you bring to the table and wanna hear your opinion. I would um, you know, wanna hear your position, wanna know how you can better serve your student athletes, especially um, you know, student athletes of color and, um, or you know, young women in your program or whatever it might, whomever it might be. Um, there are institutions that value that and, and want to hear that and administrators that want to hear that. And so, um, so I think to answer your question in terms of um, what does that path look like from my perspective, you know, I'll, I'll probably die because the, the next question that's teed up for me there, um, you know, will probably allow me to talk, talk about this a little bit more, but, or I'll, I'll, I'll get a little vulnerable with y'all. Um, but, you know, from my perspective, um, in terms of what I can control, it's, it's being willing to share my story, but share my story from a female perspective and how I've been challenged along the way just because I'm female. Um, so that hopefully other young women don't have a similar experience, but also maybe that young women can grow from my experience. Obviously interested in women and minorities playing a more significant role in college athletics so that our student athletes have people like them in positions of power being willing to have those intimate conversations that we just talked about. I mean, that's my investment. That's what I see. And that's, that's what I'm trying to pursue. And, and especially now that even my role goes beyond just college athletics, um, you know, and, and looks at, um, you know, essentially an entire student experience for a university. That's, that's my perspective and my investment and what I'm, what the path that I'm hoping to help support for others. So hopefully that answered your question a bit. I would, I mean, first off, that's a great response and I'll, I'll kind of add a couple pieces to it. So I wrote down your questions, a path to better representation. For me, you got to recruit people. You got to go out. Like for me, I go out and recruit people. Absolutely. I have a network of folks that I reach out to and say, 
I need to make sure I have a diverse pool of candidates for this position. So I'm really intentional in going out and recruiting. So I'm on this call. I got everyone's names. I'm going to put my cell phone in here. This is a recruiting opportunity for me. So I'm able to get these folks' names, check in with you. I encourage you guys to reach out to me because I want to build a robust network of people of color and minorities, male, female. So then if there's a someone reaches out to me and say, hey, I got this assistant coaching job, I can give them three or four minorities, either in gender or in race. So for me, how I do it, I'm always recruiting and trying to cultivate young talent. So that's kind of what I have done in my roles. And then the, the question, and can you, how do you pronounce your name again? Menelik? Correct, yeah, it's Menelik. Menelik. Okay, Menelik. The question about the inclusion piece. So here's what I do, man. This is what I think as a, and I'll be vulnerable, as a black male, I have to be very, very intentional in how I speak and how I present myself, right? I don't want to come off as the angry black male. I don't want to come off as playing the race card. So what I've learned, I try to weave in, what are the core values of the institution? If the core values of the institution is diversity, inclusion, student development, student enrichment, and you start to pull out some of those core values of the institution, then you can say, hey, listen, I think we are failing in our mission as an institution, and here are the, 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 the pillars of our, our, our core values and mission, right? We're failing our students because we aren't doing these elements. We're not having the proper conversation about inequality and racial injustice, right? We're not having, we're not, our, our, our administration isn't re reflective of our community. So if we're in Toronto, Toronto is a melting pot of cultures, right? It's very diverse. So if our institution isn't reflective of our community, so what are we doing? So instead of coming and saying, hey, we're not doing this, we're terrible in that, you, you pull out the core values and the mission of the institution, and you use that as your guide and share, and share with them, here's what we're failing, here's a plan, here are some recommendations on how we can align. So as an, a, a, as an AD, and I can't speak for Don, we, we get bombarded with all the issues, right? I, I am exhausted on just trying to manage the issues. But when people come to me with, with solutions and saying, I got a challenge, Tyler, here are three or four solutions that I think could work, I tend to lean in more and want to hear about the issue because this person has spent time and energy identifying an issue and then invested time and energy in coming up with some solutions. So that will be my recommendation, Menelik, is that try to make sure you align your challenges and your recommendations with the core values and missions of your institution. Now the, now the caveat, if the core values or your core values doesn't align to Don's point, that might not be a good fit. So if it's not, if they're not diligent in diversity and inclusion, and making sure they represent their community. If those things are absent, and that's really, really important to you, to Don's point, that might not be a good fit. And that's okay. That's all right. Then you got to figure out if it's something that you can tolerate, or do you feel like you can make change there? And if you can't, that might be a time for you to reevaluate kind of what's next for you in your career. So those are my two, I guess, responses to those questions that are really, really, really good. Really good questions. Thank you very much. I appreciate both of your answers. Uh, Mendel, Tyler, and Dawn, that was great. This is great. I'm, I'm, I feel like we're getting a lot of points put out there and things discussed. Mendel, you had a question. And then Aisha will, or Asia will follow up with you after. All right. Uh, my question, Don, was uh, kind of for you, but I'm, Tyler, I, I thank you because you kind of touched up a little bit on some of the. Um, things that happen uh, with me as well and the emotions that draw out of me. So Don, you brought up earlier, at 29, you, you became the AD. And um, all of a sudden you realize, oh, well, you, you're a female and you had that thought. So my question was, did that make you doubt yourself at all in any way? And part two of that question 
is what specific, if anything, that you did to kind of prepare yourself mentally to have to answer the, um, the questions about being a female AD? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mendel, for asking this question. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm going to be a little vulnerable with all of you tonight, um, which I think is really important and I've had to learn to do. So that's actually one of my key points in this. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't, I wasn't, as I mentioned earlier, I wasn't prepared for that question because it just wasn't on my radar. Once again, my, my interest in that position at Capitol, as well as Otterbein, wasn't about the fact of growing as a female administrator in this business. It was the fact that I want to build a competitive athletics program and I'm going to build the best damn division three program out there. I mean, that was my interest and still is to this day. And so, um, you know, suddenly when I'm faced with a question or a, a thought process, I mean, even at the time, and once again, I, I say this with no ego, my sports information director was actually somebody that I hired and I brought with me from the university of Dayton and when I came to Capitol, so when I when I got that job at 29, and he said to me at the time, he said, Don, I think you're the youngest AD in the country. He's like, we should do a story on this. And I said, absolutely not. And because to your question, I said, because here's what all the doubters have out there is how the heck did this 29 year old female get this job? And I gotta be honest, I was at times one of them. So I, to your question, I absolutely doubted myself. I don't know any great athlete or any you know great leader that doesn't just have those shreds and those moments. And I'm not saying I'm one of those people, but man, certainly, yeah. But I never showed that to my staff. I inherited a very, very veteran staff. The, the least amount of time one of my coaches had been on board at that point in time was 11 years. Everyone else was like 15, 20, 25 years. And like I said, then you got you know a little 20 something me walking in the door. And so, you know, really what I needed to do right away, and I was very, I, I was very aware of this, was the fact that, you know, I had to go into this, uh, you know, being certainly my authentic self, because I don't really know any other way, and invest in my coaches and genuinely get to know them as people and, and figure out what was motivating them so that I could figure out how to connect with them and motivate them too. And part of that, in those moments where, Maybe I didn't exactly have all the answers or I questioned that maybe they were looking at me a little differently or what the heck is this individual, this woman doing, was certainly not showing them any fear at all whatsoever. <laughs> um, you know, I might have gone home and looked at my husband and, you know, I had that conversation, but certainly, certainly not. So um, I definitely did, but it was more, it was kind of more from that standpoint and a really dear friend of mine. We say this to each other all the time. It's fake it till you make it, you know, sometimes. And there were certainly those moments where I had to do that. I mean, I definitely had to do that. Um, and then what specific, if any, did you, um, did you do to accept the, the women AD reality and overcome the constant questions that you had? I will tell you, it's taken me a long time. Uh, when Tyler and I were sharing our stories with each other over the weekend, you know, one of the things I, I shared with him is that, you know, for a long time, I really wanted to ignore, I, did, I didn't want any part of my story to be about the fact that I was a female AD, just because I wanted to focus on the competitiveness of my athletics programs and what my coaches and my student athletes were doing. And, it, and, and so always my answer to the question of, gosh, what's it like to be a, a female in a male dominated business for a very long time was like, oh, it's no problem. <laughs> you know, I've never faced any issues whatsoever. Well, let me tell you what a load of crap that is, <laughs> honestly, um, because I mean, there, there have been issues. There have been, you know, some really challenging, awful things that I've, I've endured. I mean, but at the same time, um, you know, I, I, I finally have come to a point um, in my career and in my experience, and I can't even tell you what has clicked but where I've realized, um, all right, maybe I've gotten more comfortable in terms of being vulnerable with others, especially, and it started with my staff and, it's, and, and then to my student athletes where I've started to share, um, you know, a, a little bit about my own experience. And I don't think I felt comfortable doing that early on in my career because I was young and I knew people were looking at me, um, you know, with, with kind of, through that kind of lens. But now as, I've, as I'm certainly more seasoned and you know, whatnot, I, I definitely think I've relaxed a little bit and I've realized there's a lot of value um, you know, in, in part of my story that I, maybe I wasn't as comfortable sharing before. And 
Um, and it's and, and how much power there is in, in being vulnerable. And that's part of being authentic with, with your team and your staff and, you know, the importance of that in leadership. So hopefully that answers your question. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. And Tyler, to the point that you brought up, which now I thank you for, is the once you realize, because the a thing that happened with me, if I can share this briefly, um, Travis, I interviewed for a position in a school where I felt like I was the better, I was the more qualified um, candidate and did not get it. And the person that got the position had never coached that, you know, the sport ever. So I felt like, okay, the only reason why you did not give me that, I, I basically played a race card because the guy that got it ended up being, being a white guy who was a baseball coach and coming in and taking over a varsity program out of high school. And I was just like, okay, that, that felt weird to me mm -hmm. and moving from New Jersey where I'm from to Minnesota where I'm at now, it was easy for me to kind of doubt myself and start blaming race as a reason mm -hmm. instead of saying, okay, um, like you guys saying, well, okay, not the right fit. The AD's view on what they're looking for is not the same thing. So I, I appreciate you saying that Tyler and thank you Don for answering. I think Don is so humble. Being 29 as an AD is like phenomenal. Like that, that's, that's she the unicorn um, to, to have that, to be afforded that opportunity. And then also to succeed that that's where we're, she's, she's a unicorn. Like that, that doesn't happen. And I think that's a credit to her um, enduring some, some challenges and just putting her head down and, and grinding and, it can be difficult, and her and I, it's funny, I'm a black male, she's a white female, but we've experienced very similar challenges, right? So I couldn't even imagine being a black female. So Asia, right? Is that is how you pronounce it? Asia? Aja? Aisha. 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 Like, being a black female, and I, I like to get people's name right, so I apologize if oh, I mess it up. <laughs> Please tell me. But being a black female, I couldn't imagine the, the difficulties of being a double minority is what I call it. Like that's very, very difficult. So I, I, I commend people that are able to endure some challenges and I operate in life that if it's not meant to be, it's not meant to be, right? Uh, but it's also good to ask for feedback. So Mandel, if you didn't get the job, there's, I don't mind providing feedback for folks that maybe I didn't hire if they ask. So if, if you feel like, hey, I feel like I was the number one candidate there is a form, there is a way that you can solicit some feedback, right? And now the feedback might not be, might not be what you want to hear. So be, be, be prepared for that. It may be harsh, but um, if you ask for some feedback of, hey, listen, I'm trying to grow professionally. I would love to get any feedback in terms of my credentials or the way I interviewed. I think it's appropriate if you're, if you're applying for jobs to ask in a respectful manner. Uh, you might not get a response back and that's okay but i think it's appropriate to, to ask for feedback if you if you didn't get a job or if you felt like you're really really close and you can i'll go take it a step first. further i'm sorry travis to interrupt i'll take just a real quick to build on tyler's um point too if you're working ever through an interview process and there's someone that you connect with in that process stay in touch with them. That's a networking, even if you don't get the job, I mean, it's a networking opportunity. I mean, Travis and I, that's, that's how we met and, you know, we've stayed in touch and, and I value this relationship. And so, you know, I think there's, there's a lot of good, you know, there's a lot of good that can come from that. So. Um, I had put a question in the chat for you, Don. Um, so my question is basically what challenges have you had let me see what I say. What challenges have you had as a female and um, like how have you overcame them? And also, I want to make a comment on something that you said. You said that, you know, you was focused on, you know, just building the program, building the department and you didn't even think about being um, a minority and being young. So like that was kind of like my mindset. I'm, I'm only 25 right now. But like when I was like in as a college student athlete and I was just like focused on like you know, trying to get skills and, and trying to, you know, 
accomplish what I wanted to accomplish. Like I had no fear. And yeah. then as soon as, you know, the African American female type thing start going around and like I just and and I wasn't scared, but it just like it just shifted my focus and I'm like, what in the world is happening? Like I didn't even used to think like that. So yeah. um you know, it was interesting that you said that because I kind of had the same experience. And then, um, so my question with that is like, what what skills do you focus on? You know, to make you um, really good at what you do, and also what um, what are some things that you had to overcome as a female? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Aisha, for asking that question. Can I ask what you do? Um, I'm director of recruiting administration at the University of Kentucky for women's awesome. basketball. We need to talk. So, talk after. To <laughs> okay. Talk. So, yeah, so basically what Tyler said, I mean, really all y'all, we should be, we should be connecting after this. Travis has our information and we'll make sure uh, we can, we can get that out and everybody with, to everybody, but we should definitely talk. So definitely. a couple of things. I mean, first of all, I don't, I don't know. I've actually, I would, I would like to take Aisha's question and, and ask that of the rest of you in terms of how, what, what kind of skills and, you know, things do you, do you think you possess that, that help you, you know, endure and, and do what you do? I mean, I, I would, I've always seen myself as an athlete. I, I mean, I, I've played sports from the time I was, you know, four years old. And, and so there's obviously so much that develops in your mind, um, you know, through athletics. And I will say, and I, I don't think it even matters that I work in college athletics. I think if I were a banker, I would probably feel the same way. Like when I face hard times, you know, it's, it's, you have this innate ability to push to push, to grind, to push through, you know, to, to prioritize what you need to get done, formulate a game plan and, and get after it. And even in those moments where I melt down, you know, cause I think everybody has those moments where it's just like, oh my gosh, the world's coming at me. Either you've got too much going on or the issues that you're dealing with are so big, you don't exactly know what to do, how to do it, whatever. You're gonna have those freak out moments, but then you, you get your head back together or you have people around you that help you get your head back together and you get refocused and, you know, laser in or zone in again on, on what you try to do. And I, I still feel like as an administrator, that's what I do. Um, I am a huge believer or, or I've become a huge believer and um, I never used to be a runner. Um, I'm a runner now. I'm a runner and I'm on my bike. And uh, I use that 30 minutes to an hour to reset and refocus. So you've got to take a little bit of time for yourselves. And I was never good at this before, especially early in my career. And I, I've had to develop it as a skill, but taking a little bit of time for yourself. And I'm a mom, I'm a mom of a three-year-old. <laughs> so he's all over me. I'm surprised he hasn't busted in tonight. Uh, hopefully he's in bed now, but anyways, um, you know, it's just, you know, you, you have to carve out a little bit of time for yourself in order to get your head right. And so that you can figure out how you wanna game plan and attack what you're working on. As a female, um, I mean, there's a lot of things that have kind of come up at me. I mean, uh, kind of the classic, and this will set the tone for what I'm about to say. The classic question I, I would get, especially a little bit early on in my career when I was in the, certainly the young AD mode, um, was I would get asked, especially by, you know, maybe male alumni or whatnot is, are you the AD for, for, um, are you the AD for the whole program? Are you the AD for the men's and the women's program? I mean, so you control everything, you know, and I'd always say I, I absolutely do. And so, you know, I mean, there was just always, you know, whenever I would get that question, there's a little bit of self doubt and, you know, and, and some of those folks, um, I still cultivated really good relationships with, I mean, it, it just, you know, going into it with, you know, an open mind and, and, you know, trying to understand where people are coming from sometimes and, and realizing that not everyone was trying to offend me, you know, and it's not like I got it often, but I, I got it on a fair amount of times. And then there were other times where I've, I've been asked and, you know, and, and there's been some pretty negative things that have happened in my experience. And, um, those are experiences that you walk away from and, um, you know, in my own way, I grow from, although I would never want to empower that person to, to think that, that they allowed me to grow. But at the same time, you, you've got you've to figure out something to take away from that that's positive. At least that's my mindset. And uh, I've become better. And like I said, I think in a lot of ways, it's also what, what has allowed me to become a little bit more vulnerable and, and, and share and especially share with 
um, you know, um, any of my, my students, my interns, my uh, female young professionals that work with me, um, just about navigating um, this business. And I don't want to paint it as a bad picture because it's not. Um, you know, I've, I've had a handful of experiences that have just, you know, are, are not, not awesome. But, um, you know, and things happen, but you move on and, and hopefully you become better, you know, through it. So we can talk a lot more off, offline, Aisha. I'd, be, I'd love to connect with you. Good. Let's do it. Brent, good luck. Uh, um, Brent Daniels, I'm the, well, I was the head basketball coach and athletic director at Holy Family College and NAI in Wisconsin. We're unfortunately um, closing this summer with everything going on. But um, I became the AD here at 31. Um, and I just wondered your guys' input. I know in coaching, this is big too. When you take over a place as a young administrator or, or the head of something young, how did you guys tackle the, well, this is how we've always done it here scenario, especially maybe taking over a place that experienced success with older people um, that are now working under you? Tyler, let's go with you. I think it, it's, it's difficult and, and how I, I approached it in every style. I, in my career, I, I've had to manage people that were significantly older than I was. And I was fine with it because I, to, to, to Don's point, I harken back to my athletic experience. Hey, you got to earn people's respect. If you go in knowing that you have to earn it, people appreciate that, that you put the effort into earning their respect. So that, that part of it is, is probably number one. Number two, I think you have to authentically cultivate a relationship. It's okay to reach out to them to learn about their experience, get a better feel about what has happened in the past. I think that's really important to know the past, to be able to build a plan for the future. So if you're authentically and intentionally trying to learn from those folks, they tend to lean in more. And then the third part of it, and this is what I, I – I, I'm not a psychologist at anything, but I know people well enough is that if you say, if our goal is to grow and evolve, then we have to grow and evolve our processes and our approaches. If we want to stay stagnant and just do what we've always done, we're going to get what we always got. So I, I challenge my staff in saying, what are your goals? What do you see our organization going in five years, right? And then once they've identified that they want to grow and move it forward, then that's my opportunity to say, hey, we have to evolve our approach and we have to infuse new ideas. So those are the top three kind of tactics I've deployed in trying to, A, gain respect and earn respect, you know, lean in and try to cultivate the relationship. And then three, really building out a plan for the future and showing them that this is a growth plan for the organization. I mean, that, that's been my success there. Now, has it always worked? Absolutely not. There are some folks that are like, hey, this is my, this is who I am. I am not evolving. You're not going to teach this old dog new tricks. I am, this is what I'm doing, and that's fine. And typically, if you're building a strong culture, those folks stand out. Like, they are the minority in the organization. So if you build your framework really strong, and the majority of the folks are in, those folks are the outliers, and they typically almost dissolve from the organization either they find a new a new role or they they figure out that the pace is too fast and they can't keep up but that's what i've deployed at my stops at here at cleveland state and also at ohio state i don't think i could say that any better i would 100 percent agree with with tyler uh he right on with all of that i mean it's, it's all about relationship building, you know, when you're, when you're coming, no matter how old you are, how old they are, where you, what you look like, where you're coming from, whatever, this is about building relationships and, you know, cultivating um, those individuals, building trust and, and then figuring out almost, I mean, to kind of, to fast forward through, you know, what Tyler said, it's, it's like, okay, fast forwarding, if you can, if, can you work together, you know, mm -hmm. are you both bought into the same um, ideals and, and ultimately, you know, the outcomes for the, for the organization or the institution. So all about relationship building. Changing a culture is probably the, the most difficult task 
is changing our culture and changing a mindset. And that that's that's not X's and O's. That's helping to develop people. I mean that that's very 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 difficult and. It's a labor of love, man. You have to really love what you do and care about the people you work with, but it's it's a it's a difficult task. Thank you. We got about 10 minutes left just to be respectful of time, so we'll finish up with Jonathan, and then if there's somebody that has another quick one, put it in the chat, and when we summarize, uh, I'll ask it. Um, but Jonathan, go ahead. So uh, probably touching us a little bit throughout the conversation, but what do you find are the biggest challenges of trying to quote unquote, break the glass ceiling? Um, you know, everybody's challenges are different. I mean, my glass ceiling is I'm trying to coach basketball, but I didn't play in college or high school. So that's a huge challenge for me trying to gain respect from players or even people trying to hire me as assistant coaches. Um, you know, maybe it's for Don trying to get more women into the industry or you getting more minorities in the industry. Um, and maybe not even into entry level positions. So what do you see the biggest challenge of trying to break the glass ceiling? Dawn, let's go with you. That's a, I appreciate you always teeing me up on these tough ones. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you know what? That's a great question. I, you know, I, I, I don't know exactly how to answer that. I, I think, I, all I can tell you is what I, what I'm trying to do, and you know, is is first of all, and, and Tyler shared this earlier, is continuing to grow my network, um, and and you know, be a, a student of of not only this business, but really of the world in a lot of ways too. I, I don't have all the answers, y'all. I appreciate you giving me the, an opportunity to talk with you tonight. I don't have all the answers. Um, but what I know is that I'm really still hungry to learn. I still feel like that 22 year old recent grad that wanted to take over the box office at the University of Dayton. I mean, I want to learn. I want to grow. I want to meet new people. I want to hear about their experiences. Um, you know, and and I, I happen to be, I happen to have uh, or be in a position of, of some power, you know, at my institution. So where I can, um, I try to to try to find people um, that mirror that energy in, in a lot of ways that are, you know, what I call PhDs or poor, hungry and driven, you know, <laughs> so that mm. really want to learn, want to grow, want to be, you know, want to be, um, but that are also um, self-aware, authentic, know who they are, and maybe are willing to invest in, in, in our institution and, and, and maybe in, in me as well. Um, so I'm not sure how well I answered your question other than, than that's, that's my approach to, um, you know, my process every day and, and, and how I'm trying to just, you know, be a better leader, leader and ultimately serve my coaches and my student athletes. They're my family. And, you know, and, and that's, that's what I want to do for them. So Tyler, what do you got? I, there, I think there's no silver bullet to that. I think everyone's scratching and clawing just to kind of make their break, but similar to Don and what I do and, I, I love hanging out and interacting with young people, young professionals. So I volunteer my time a ton in mentorship. So I have a number of mentees that I, I try to invest in because, A, kind of going back to my original story, someone poured into my life. And I'm just like, I have to give back and pay it forward. So for me, I have a, a, a pool of just young professionals that, it's somewhat selfish because I want to have a pulse on the emerging folks, the young coaches, the young administrators, because I, I find gratification in plugging people together, right? So if Don is like, hey, listen, I'm looking for a young, hungry director of recruiting for their football program, right? So a young Don, right? Um, do you have three or four names? I want to be a person that people call and text me Hey, I'm looking for a young professional in X field. So I take, I think there's a responsibility for me as, as a minority that I should be able to give folks three or four names. Cause I think it's important to have a diverse pool of candidates, right? So I, I take ownership of trying to cultivate the young talent. That's, that's one tactic. But also I think too, is that doing what I'm doing here investing my time and talking with people and sharing my story 
and to Don's point, growing my network. So those are kind of the two tactics in my role, trying to cultivate new talent, build relationships, and then you know trying to connect with people to build my own network as well. Good. Can I? I'll, I want to jump in. I know this is the Dawn and Tyler show, but I want to kind of answer <laughs> Jonathan, you know, because I, I call it shoulder soldiers, right? We kind of shoulder soldiers. So we in the war together. We side by side. We're both trying to grow. And I'm, I'm lyrically motivated. So when I get to my frustration or my limits, I use music to kind of pull me out of that. And there's a quote, it's, it's, a, it's a lyric that goes, God give his toughest battles to his strongest soldiers. So if you, if you understand, like, there's a plan for me and there's a way and you keep grinding and you keep pushing, because as we listen to countless amounts of speakers over the last th three months, everyone's story is the same. I mean, the, different. No one's story is the same. So you just got to understand that President Obama said hard things are hard. Right? So it's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. And if you keep doing the same thing and you keep getting the same result, you got to tweak, tweak the, the game plan a little bit and, and take a different route into a different avenue. And when it happens, it's going to happen. It's going to happen when you least expect it. But just keep grinding, man. Just understand that the route that you chose is tough. And if it's really what you want to do, just be consistent with it. Um, Kareem, you got our last question. And then yeah. Um, Kareem Brown from Niagara County Community College. Uh, Tyler and Dawn, this has been great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my question for you is, is in light of what's going on uh, in the world today, kind of how have you, have you guys talked about it with your, with your staff um, or, or in general with maybe one or two people on your staff? And then my second part of that is uh, knowing now how our athletes and, and young people in general now have kind of almost enlightened with the power now that they've kind of had what challenges or do you feel you need to address any of that come September? Thanks, Kareem. I, that's, that's a wonderful question. Um, I am really proud to be a part of an institution um, that has always embraced diversity and inclusion from its, from its, Founding. I mean, that's that's been a large part of what Otterbein is about. Um, and, you know, in terms of in respect to all the different leadership that we've had through even 100 years, I mean, that's that's been a large part of what we're about. So um, when we look at the the racial equity inequity dialogue that's going on right now and and the just heartbreaking situations that have happened over the last um, several weeks. On a lot of levels, we were already having a lot of conversation and now perhaps, you know, it's, it's heightened it a little bit more or made us take a step back and, and reflect on, on some of the conversation that we were already having as well as actions that we were um, planning to take and implement. Um, so I think that's where we are. It, and I, I feel fortunate in some ways that I think we were in a little bit of a, a unique position. And I, I certainly say that with no arrogance or pride whatsoever, because I think we're constantly evolving as an institution and trying to get better at, at serving um, all of our students, especially in the last few weeks, our black students. Um, specifically within our athletics program, um, one of the things that we're trying to cultivate and, and have been trying to cultivate over the last few years, um, we have, I'm, I'm sure many of you as, as a part of your institution within your athletic programs, you have student athlete advisory councils. Um, I, I'm really, I've been very interested to know what my student athletes of color um, are thinking and feeling and, and, and how do they want to engage. And I, I really value our student athlete experience and perspective and I, I want to know, um, especially with our student athletes of color, what what they're thinking as well. And so we're looking at creating a separate group that hasn't come out of the last few weeks and and the situations that have taken place over the last few weeks. But it's definitely um, amped up conversation for us as well in terms of how we can continue to develop opportunities to interact. Um, but uh, those are just that's a little bit about where Otterbein is and 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 where we are. And once again, I mean, I'll, I'll just continue to say that um, as an administrator and especially, you know, as a, as a female in this business, I mean, I know my own story. I know my own experience. I certainly don't pretend to know others. And um, I've got to approach each and every person with 
um, with respect and open-mindedness and, 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 and an attempt to understand um, so that I can try to serve my kids and my coaches the best way possible. And, and that's, once again, just how I'm trying to approach it. Very, very similar to Dawn's approach. We've, we've, we've been having some very meaningful dialogue first with our, our coaches and staff on how to create a safe environment for people to share. That's really, really important um, on, on two sides, right? It's important to create an environment where our, our black student athletes are not bombarded with this responsibility to share their trauma, right? That we have to really protect that, that population of student athletes. So how do you create that environment that they feel comfortable sharing? Because they should be empowered to lead the conversation. So that's one part of it. But the other part, you want to create an environment where our white athletes feel comfortable to ask questions and be curious, right? Um, that part of it is delicate because, yeah, some of them are ignorant and it's not their fault. They're just ignorant because they haven't been exposed to it, to it right? So they're apprehensive to share and ask questions because for me, I want our athletes to be curious and to ask questions because the more curious they are, the more questions that, that they ask, the better we can educate them. So we're trying to create this environment where we can have some really good conversations and challenging our coaches to assess what that looks like is, is probably the first step. And then for us, we want to have action. So we can talk to we're blue in the face, but if we're not doing anything, what are the, what are the action items? So we're, we're putting some, some time on what, what does that look like, Kareem, in September when our athletes are on campus? What are we doing from a programming perspective, right? We want to not only talk about it, but be about it. So that's what we've been doing here on campus over the last month of having the conversations and then developing some action items, but also making sure our student athletes understand their platform. I think sometimes they're unaware of, of, of how do they articulate how they're feeling in a way that's authentic to them, but it's educated, right? They're, they're not spewing out information that's inaccurate. So on our end, we wanna make sure we educate our student athletes and provide them the resources for them to educate themselves. Those are the conversations that we've had on our campus over the last month. Good. Um, as we finalize, I, I want to ask a final question because the topic today was really diversity at the small level and uh, diversity in administration at the, at the division one level. Um, whenever you take water and try to put out an oil fire, there's a reverse reaction. And we, everyone talks about we need more minorities here and we need more females here. But I think oftentimes we tend to forget there are, there are a lot of really, really good white males in this industry also. So my question for you two as, as, we, as we finish up the, the, the show is, how do we create diversity without losing the good white man? Because I don't think in most cases they should be penalized for just the color of their skin either. Because what happens when you continually, consistently and over and over and repetitively talk about how important the diverse male is, right, from a culture perspective. If you only talk about how good your shooters are and never give any, any nuggets to your post players, eventually your post players are going to go away from you. You're not going to have a chance to have success. So to make this thing successful from an athletic directing position, how do you integrate the two or what suggestions or thought process or conversations you had just in 75 seconds or less of how do we not lose – what those good guys bring to the table also. Because there's only a few that we say, man, it, it needs to be more in these positions, if that makes right. sense. Right. I, I'll take this one first, Don. Um, I, first off, that's a really good question. And I think I, I'm so proud and happy that it's asked. Because I think some, some populations feel disenfranchised when there's a movement. So the Me Too movement happened, right? And then a population, the LBGTQ group is like, well, what about us? And then now you have the Black Lives Matter piece. And then what about black women, right? Everything has been about black males and empowering black males, right? So for me, I try to flip it and saying, just because we are highlighting this population of people, I would hope that we're not, the perception is that we're taking away opportunities from others. So once you understand that part of that, it's not necessarily there's not an infinite number of opportunities and we're just, you're, you're taking some from this group and giving it to the other. But if everyone appreciates diversity, 
right? It could be flipped. If you're at an HBCU and you got a whole staff of, of black coaches, it might be good to have some diversity in your staff there too, right? Or hopefully very soon we diversify our male men's basketball staff with female coaches, right? So I would hope that people don't perceive it as that we're disenfranch disenfranchising different groups because this is the focus and priority that they all lean in and see the value in it. But to your point, I think we still should acknowledge it. That's just my my personal opinion. So I'll, I'll kick it off to Don. Yeah, I, I think all that's really well said. I would agree, Travis. Thank you for asking that question. I, I think it continues to, I think we all need to continue to accept the challenge of developing our networks so that we can continue to refine or, or build the best pools possible for our positions and, you know, and, and really think critically about um, the right fit for each of those positions. And, and, and once again, that's only going to come if we're really diligent about broadening our network as much as possible, developing relationships so that, yes, I can pick up the phone and call Tyler and say, hey, here's what I'm looking for. Here's, here's really what my program needs. Here's some niche things. Who you got? Um, you know, that's, that's what we've got to continue to develop. And I, I think that ultimately is going to help, you know, help us keep the right people, put the right people in place, um, you know, at our respective institutions and, and find that right fit. Good. Um, well, Dawn and Tyler, I thank you um, for taking the time, taking this hour and 45 minutes to, to spend time with the Rising Coaches Search Firm, right? I call it a tree for the treeless. Uh, for those of you that don't know, they, I was excited about this because they are two very, very special people. Um, Tyler was my, my college roommate, like I mentioned earlier. Um, Tyler didn't mention his, his personal path where he lost his mom as soon as he got to college. And you all, the majority of people that have watched me talk, they know I lost my dad. I, I don't know my dad. So we really had a lot of interpersonal or in, internal conversations just me growing and learning from the things that he, the struggles and things that he had with his dad or, or things that I may have learned and gained from my mom and understanding like the, the heartbreak between the two. So to watch him grow and develop and walk amongst, I mean, to, to be the, the minority in the room and have such success has been a, has been a blast to see just from a, a, a teammate. And for Dawn, I mean, she gave me one of the first opportunities to ever see what small college was like. I mean, I had an interview uh, for the head job at her institution and I didn't get it, but I felt the connection between us was so strong and she was someone that I needed to stay in touch with. And, and she has truly had success because she is genuine and real and invested in the changing people. Now, one of the most powerful things she ever said to me is we were in the interview process and she said, my job is to make you the best coach that you can be. And you don't hear me athletic director say that. And she mm -hmm. said, I show up every day to work as hard as I can to make you be the best that you can be. And at that point, I knew she was the right person for that fit, right? And it wasn't white male, it wasn't black male. It, it was, this is great for the diversity of sports. This is great for college athletics. So hopefully everyone took something from it. Um, those that watched the recordings and those that were on the YouTube stream, um, it, it was a very, very powerful 90 minutes or so. So thank you all for great job. being part of it. Great questions, guys. Yeah, big thanks to all of you guys. Good this stuff. Good stuff. Well, enjoy your night, everyone. And again, I left my cell phone and email. Please, please, please reach out. If you don't, I will be offended. So shoot me a text, <laughs> shoot me a note. I'll echo that too. I put my contact information yeah. on there as well. So feel free, however, however I can help you. Yep. Thanks so much for taking the time, guys. Appreciate this. Good luck with everything, all right? Take care. Sure. See you guys. See. Take care. Hold on, don't end it, Travis. I'm trying to get... um. The contact information. Sound like she want to talk to you. <laughs> now I'm saying I'm trying to take advantage. Where she put it? Yeah. If you need it, if you can't find it on there, just email me or chat me and I can send it to you. Okay, I see it. Kareem, I appreciate you, bro. No problem, no problem. I, I uh, actually forgot this YouTube. So I got to tell Adam to, to, uh,